as Michelle mentioned, I'm <clears throat> founder and chief scientist at Deep Storage LLC. Um, primarily, we're an independent test lab where vendors like Atlantis send us their gear and we beat it into submission. Um, I want to start by identifying the major trends that are driving innovation in the IT industry as a whole. And the biggest thing is that the gap between the performance of our processors in general purpose compute platforms and storage in those platforms has been growing substantially. And over the past decade, the amount of compute power in an x86 processor has grown approximately 50 times. So the Dell PowerEdge 2950 that you bought at in 2005 has 1 50th or less the compute power of the PowerEdge R730 that you would buy today. At the same time, the cost of flash is falling at about a 40% compound annual growth rate. So every year that SSD costs almost, just a bit more than half as much as that SSD cost the last year. At the same time, hard drive speeds have stagnated since 2000 when the first 15K RPM drive came out. So flash-based SSDs have become both cost-effective and fit in the middle of that constantly growing compute to storage performance gap. So the response from the market to these changes in the available components we can use to build our IT infrastructure has been for a new class of storage systems, software-defined storage, to enter the market. This change in the available components to the infrastructure industry has developed a new class of storage-based server products that we call software-defined storage. I tend to take a broader view of what qualifies as software-defined storage than some of my fellow pundits. Basically, in a software-defined storage system, a, an industry standard x86 server replaces the custom hardware, including custom application-specific integrated circuits and field programmable gate arrays that constituted storage in the days when EMC's Symmetrics was the 800-pound gorilla of the storage industry. These x86 servers can be either physical or virtual, that is, the software that makes a storage controller out of the server can run bare metal or in a virtual machine. The advantage here is much faster development times. If you have your programmers writing software on standard x86 servers, then you can run build-a-day and agile programming into your development process. However, if you're doing ASIC programming, it takes days or weeks for a new chip to come back from the foundry after you've made changes to it. Even with FPGAs, you can only get one or two turns a week instead of the multiple turns a day you can get writing pure software. These systems use DRAM and or Flash for their performance. Some software-defined storage systems run Flash as their capacity layer as well, essentially creating an all-Flash array. Others use spinning disks to create a multi-layered hybrid approach for greater efficiency. These systems all use a modern data layout, which I'll discuss in a moment, and there's a wide variety of architectural options available. Since we're just running software, perhaps in a virtual machine, where that software gets deployed 
can vary substantially, moving us away from simple dual controller HA architectures. Now, when I talk about modern storage, there are several attributes of the way data is stored on the media that I'm talking about. The main attribute of a modern storage system, to my point of view, is the use of a log structure. When new data comes into the storage system, rather than having small IOs generate small writes on the storage system, and therefore very large numbers of IO operations that have to be con concluded every second in a very random way, we're going to collect and coalesce those writes into a log device on some high performance medium. Depending on the storage system, that medium can be NVRAM or replicated DRAM or high speed flash. Once the data is accumulated in the log, it's written to the back end storage in large sequential chunks. And this is friendly for both RAID and for SSDs. For RAID, the size of the chunk is designed to be exactly equal to one full stripe write to the RAID system. So if I have a 4 plus 1 RAID system and 64K strips, every write from the log to the back end storage is going to be 256K and I'll never have to read from the parity drive and recompute the parity. It also means that a data volume is no longer a block range within the RAID set the data lives on, but is now a metadata structure that's a list of the logical blocks. Because destaging from the log writes to whatever free space is available on the back and storage, the physical to logical location map metadata defines the volume. This means that if I want to create a snapshot, I just copy the metadata structure that defines a volume. If I want to make a clone, I just allow people to write to that newly created object that is a copy of the metadata. All in all, we get the efficiency that modern storage systems need to deliver. If you think about this in terms of a hybrid system, hybrid systems always need this kind of metadata so they can keep track of which blocks are stored on their high performance tier and which blocks are stored on their low performance tier. As I mentioned earlier, software-defined storage delivers a wide variety of architectures. So I can have dual controller HA systems with or without shared storage. I can use Flash or DRAM on the server side to accelerate the access to existing back-end disk-based systems. I can take the disk and SSD resources of my virtualization hosts themselves and make a common storage pool out of them. That would be a hyper-converged environment if I took servers and pooled their storage together it, without running VMs. That would be a scale-out storage architecture. All of these give the infrastructure architect a lot of control over how he adds storage capacity and storage performance as the system grows, putting performance in the appropriate place. Atlantis's USX is a VM-based software-defined storage management system. So the storage management function runs as a series of virtual machines under either vSphere or Zen server. Those virtual machines can pool together resources to create storage volumes using host DRAM, host flash, 
host disk and or shared storage in a wide variety of combinations on top of whatever storage is used for both the performance and the capacity layers in a USX system, Atlantis layers on top of it their file system which provides the modern data format and therefore functionality like low-cost snapshots, almost instant cloning and the like. Atlantis sells USX as a software-only product, and they also sell an appliance version that they call Hyperscale. I'd like Seth to explain to us for a minute what Atlantis means by USX and Hyperscale. Sure. Uh, thanks, Howard. Um, so in looking at Hyperscale versus Atlantis USX, USX is kind of as Howard discussed before, a pure software-defined storage platform. It's uh, all software. You can apply it to existing infrastructure um, and pool any combination of SAN, NAS, DAS, Flash, DRAM, and create many different types of uh, storage volume layouts. For example, hybrid, all Flash, uh, completely in memory um, type. Uh, storage volumes, and it can work with any server or storage that's supported by the hypervisor that you're running on. So in our case, that's either uh, vSphere or Citrix Zen server. So a lot of customers use Atlantis USX when they have um, hardware configurations that um, either they've already invested in existing infrastructure, um, or they have hardware configurations like they might want to do hyper-converged on blades, for example, which is not a model that's uh, offered with our hyperscale appliance. Now, Howard's testing was done on Atlantis USX in the hardware he already had in his lab. Um, so he uh, you know, chose to use the USX um, product. Atlantis Hyperscale, conversely, is a hardware appliance. So you purchase um, you know, a four-node appliance uh, and in you know an hour, you rack, stack, power it, and you have storage volumes, a virtualized system uh, ready to go with a hypervisor laid out on it. The other difference is um, it's a fixed configuration, so it's an all-flash hyper-converged appliance. Um, so we are doing uh, in-memory um, optimization of the I/O traffic and using DRAM uh, that's uh, protected across the, the four nodes and then um, using Flash as the primary uh, tier of storage. And it has the same uh, functionality from a data services perspective. So you know, cloning, provisioning, how you manage volumes um, is consistent across the two uh, platforms. So it'll be very similar to what Howard tested, except the hardware in this case is a much higher spec hardware in an all Flash configuration instead of the um, hybrid configurations that Howard tested. So it'll be a higher level of performance consistent with a kind of an all-flash array versus a uh, hybrid array. And the other part that's interesting is that uh, we're providing end-to-end -end support for the appliance. So you have kind of one person to call for any problem, you know, ranging from a disk failure, a problem with the hypervisor, all the way up to, you know, functional um, questions or things that you want to uh, call support about relative to the storage volumes and the software defined storage layer. So with that, let me, I'll drop out and we'll uh, uh, get more information on the testing from Howard. Thank you, Seth. Frankly, when I first thought about all flash hyper-converged systems, I was questioning how efficient they could be. Um, there are certain aspects of the hyperconverged architecture that, for example, are less efficient at the use of storage than if you have multiple controllers sharing the same medium. Um, when I first actually saw hyperscale, uh, the price was the decision factor for me. Um, I don't, you know, it, if, if the system requires more flash than some other architecture but still costs less when I buy it. I'm happy with that. And Hyperscale reminded me quite a bit of Evo Rail, 
Uh, both are programs that allow users to buy hardware from multiple hardware vendors. You know, with hyperscale, the servers can come from Supermicro or Lenovo or HP or others. Um, similarly, Evo Rail is a product that's sold through multiple OEMs but defined by VMware. Um, what was really interesting, though, is when I did the math and looked at what the relative prices were. You know, hyperscale is using, you know, delivering about twice the CPU and a little bit more memory per node. They're delivering almost twice the usable capacity because USX does data reduction with compression and deduplication, and Atlantis is selling a, an appliance of four nodes that's. 12 terabytes of usable capacity, that's an assumption of about a 3 to 1 reduction ratio, and most of the real world cases I've seen for virtualization are between 4 and 5 to 1, so I'm comfortable with that. And when I added in the software to make everything look comparable, hyperscale still came out somewhere between 25 and 35 percent cheaper depending on which OEM you were choosing in their MSRP. Um, it would also probably be safe to say that the higher, the vendors who have higher list prices are also the vendors who typically sell to large customers and therefore offer bigger discounts. So the street prices are probably closer to the lower end than the higher end of the scale for both vendors. Twice as much horsepower, a little bit less price, that's a combination I'm pretty happy with. So when you install Atlantis USX in your environment, it will create multiple virtual machines. Right, one virtual machine that's installed first provides the management functions and the graphical user interface. Um, service VMs on each host that's providing storage to the cluster manage donating those resources to USX's use, and those resources can include local flash, local disk, and local DRAM. When you create volumes, a new VM to serve up that volume is created. That volume VM <coughs> distributes data across the service VMs of multiple nodes to provide data protection, and offers up the volume via NFS or iSCSI. Unlike some other hyperconverged solutions, USX does allow systems to consume storage that it offers up without contributing storage. So you can access those volumes via NFS or iSCSI from another physical server without having to deploy volume and service VMs on it. All of the volumes that are created use a two-tier model with a DRAM or flash performance layer and a flash or disk capacity layer. Regardless of what actual persistent storage layers are being used, DRAM is used for the USX file system metadata to maximize performance. When DRAM is used in cases where resiliency is required, the data will be replicated to the DRAM of multiple nodes so that data isn't lost in the event of a node failure. So each USX volume uses the USX file system to create metadata-based snapshots and clones from its modern storage layout. These can be managed via VAAI today, and VVOL support will be available real soon now. I would guess, and am not here speaking for Atlantis, that it would be before the end of this year, probably well before the end of this year. Um, volumes are, of course, thin provisioned, and data is reduced by deduplication and compression. Users have broad choices about where data is located and about what the resiliency level is. 
so volumes can replicate data across nodes to provide resiliency against node failures or for applications where resiliency is less important than performance like non-persistent VDI desktops, you can run just out of local flash and DRAM to provide very high performance. Um, you can also provide resiliency for the volume VM so that if the host or volume VM crashes, data remains available to the VMs on another host. As you can see from this slide, USX offers a wide variety of volume types, okay? from hyperconverged to a hybrid volume type that uses local DRAM and or flash to accelerate shared storage to all flash. And then the simple volume types run on a single host, either for very small test and dev environments or again for those applications where resiliency is of lesser import. We found all of this was managed through a simple graphical user interface that rapidly gave us the information we needed to see how the system was working. When we brought USX into the lab, we set it up on our workhouse workhorse dual Xeon 5520 servers. These servers have 96 gigabytes of RAM and frankly are a step or two behind anything you would buy today in performance. So this is a good thing for our kind of testing because if we see that an application like USX is consuming a small amount of CPU in this environment, in an environment where much more CPU is available, that's going to be a negligible amount of CPU. Our each server has an OCZ Intrepid 3800 SSD. This is OCZ's top of the line enterprise SATA SSD and provides 40 to 50,000 IOPS in a straight up read test looking for a hero number. Think of it as comparable to the Intel DCS3700. We are all connected via 10 gigabit ethernet and for testing of a hybrid volume, we used our Equalogic PS3800. This system has 16 15K RPM drives and one gigabit per second iSCSI interconnects. So it's a good analog for a customer who'd like to use hybrid volumes to get another couple of years out of the storage array they're already running in the data center. So we created a hybrid volume using the OCZ Intrepid SSD for performance and the Equalogic for capacity, and a hyper-converged volume using the SSDs and 7200 RPM disks across four servers in our cluster. We tested these volumes with two benchmarks. Iometer, which is simple to run and gives us some basic information, and an application level benchmark, HammerDB, that uses SQL Server. Because both of these are hybrid systems with a separate performance and capacity layer, we refuse to just look for the hero number by putting a very small data set on the system so it can run entirely out of flash. We test against three data set sizes, one smaller than the amount of flash, one approximately twice the size of the amount of flash, and one approximately four times the size of the amount of flash. The idea here is to see how the system is going to work in the real world where both the flash and disk are fully active. When running our 4K OLTP workload on the hybrid volume, 
we, you, as you can see, the baseline, the green line, represents the Ecologic Array alone. And it delivers, at best, about a thousand IOPS. However, at that thousand IOPS, we're reaching 30 or 40 milliseconds of latency. All of the hybrid volumes created by USX perform substantially better. And as you can, would assume, the version where all the data fit in Flash provides somewhat better performance than those that are actually using the disks. But USX here, we can tell, was doing a very good job at keeping the hot data in Flash. On the hyper-converged volume, even though the back end was slower, the system managed to deliver 20,000 IOPS at a fully reasonable level of latency. HammerDB is a bit more complex test. HammerDB emulates a, uh, HammerDB is an open source tool that generates SQL Server or other SQL database server load. Uh, it uses a workload created by the Transaction Performance Council that emulates a wholesale distributor. And you can dial in how many warehouses that distributor has, which adjusts the size of the database, and how many virtual users are hitting that database. In our testing, Frankly, our SQL Server became overwhelmed at high loads. And so in both the hybrid and hyper-converged cases, it, they, it delivered two to three times the performance that the Equalogic system was able to deliver. But as we increased the number of virtual servers, we hit performance limitations in the SQL Server. We also ran some testing of the hybrid USX array with Flash and our Equalogic array compared to a modern hybrid array we have in the lab. Now, we're not naming whose system that is, but it is one of the better hybrid arrays on the market. And even though that system has a substantial amount of Flash, using local flash via the hybrid volume from USX provided a substantial amount of acceleration. To sum up, software-defined storage leverages the advantages we've gotten from the component vendors. Processors are running faster, memory is becoming cheaper, and servers accommodate substantially more memory than they did previously, and the current generation of servers can have a terabyte of DRAM, which for someone who grew up on a mainframe that had four megabytes of memory is a scary thought. And Flash has become more and more cost-effective as storage, especially if the software running on top of that Flash does intelligent data reduction via deduplication and compression. Atlantis USX, by layering the USX file system on top of almost any resource you can find in your hypervisor environment, offers a full set of features and a flexible deployment model. You can intermingle on the same infrastructure, hyperconverged, all flash, and hybrid solutions that use DRAM as their acceleration layer. With the advent of VVOL support in the next several months, this will mean that you can layer USX on top of your existing storage system and get all of the per volume snapshot, excuse me, per virtual machine volume snapshot and protection functionality that VVOLs offer without having to upgrade your storage system because your vendor isn't offering VVOLs on the one you bought last week. That basically brings us to the end of my prepared statement. Um, at this point, 
we can open the floor for questions and see if any of you have would like to know more about USX or about our testing process. Okay, Howard, I'm uh, fielding some questions that came in. I answered a few of them along the way. Um, one of the questions that uh, came in uh, that would probably be appropriate for you to, to address is, um, why do you compare against EvoRail as opposed to SimpliVity or Nutanix? And you know, what are your similar thoughts on uh, hyperscale versus those other two hyperconverged systems? Well. In, in the in the first place, hyperscale because it you offer the hardware flexibility struck me as similar to EvoRail. Um, frankly, the other point is just that EvoRail pricing is much more readily available. Um, neither Nutanix nor SimpliVity publish a list price, where the vendors who are EvoRail OEMs do. So it's you know frankly, I was a bit lazy and it's much easier for me to use public information than to try and... And I believe you wrote a uh, blog on the topic as well with uh, URL. Well, I, I, wrote a blog, I wrote a blog on the, on the topic when you guys introduced Hyperscale because I had previously written a blog about how I thought that um, all flash hyperconvergence was not a great idea. Um, mm -hmm because you would need more flash than an all flash array and flash is a big part of the cost of the total system and therefore I didn't think you could make it economical. Uh, and then you guys came out and proved me wrong. So um, anybody who did when I'm wrong. Yeah, so we, we've done a bit more research on some of the competitive pricing. Anybody who's interested in looking at some of those other comparisons, um, we have a uh, like a cost comparison tool that's at www.atlantiscomputing.com slash hyperscale dash cost and it's also on the main hyperscale page um, and we've kind of scoured for public resources there on the pricing of comparable models so go take a look at that if you're interested. Another question that was I think useful to repeat the answer um, that was more directed at myself was um, we didn't really talk about the server platforms that Hyperscale was available on, so there was a question about what the server platforms were. And my initial, I had a bad mistake on my initial response and corrected it. So let me just state the, um, the different options there. Um, so there's four server platforms currently certified uh, with Hyperscale, which include Supermicro, HP, Dell, and, oh, sorry, Lenovo and Cisco. Um, there are spec sheets for each one of those on the, the hyperscale page, so you can see which specific models um, of those servers are used. And in all cases, they have um, similar specifications and, and, uh, from a CPU and memory uh, perspective, um, but use uh, you know, the, the, the optimal server model for the four node configuration in each case. So again, Supermicro, HP, Lenovo, and uh, Cisco options available. And each of those have a 12 terabyte or a 24 terabyte model with four node appliances. Okay, next uh, question. Um, there was a, a good question, which um, is I can, you know, you had some experience testing uh, this, Howard, so I think both of us can kind of answer it, which was um, you know, we have specs where we have uh, between 256 and um, 512 gigs of RAM per node in hyperscale. And in USX, obviously, you can use any amount of uh, RAM and CPU, and there's a minimum system configuration. So the, the question was, what are the kind of available resources after? So um, I'll, I'll go first, and then you can share your experience in terms of how it functioned during the testing. Um, Hyperscale's default configuration has uh, 79 megabytes per, uh, of RAM per node um, consumed and um, um, in RAM. Therefore, you know, if you have uh, one terabyte, uh, yeah, sorry, gigabytes, um, you know, and it's available in options where you would have a total of one terabyte or two terabytes of RAM. 
so you can work out the um, percentages uh, that are remaining. So it's about 70% uh, in a uh, 12 uh, terabyte configuration that's re or in a one ter one terabyte of RAM configuration remaining. So any thoughts you wanted to share on kind of the resource utilization, CPU, anything like that well, remaining available for the compute layer? Right. So you know we were running on you know, Nehalem generation Xeons, so you know, they're the quad core, and so we've got eight cores per server. And you guys were basically consuming about one and a half when we were pounding the system with a benchmark. Of course, you know when you start writing very write-intensive benchmark data to a system that does data deduplication. You know, CPU utilization is going to go up beyond what it would in the real world because most applications are much more read than write intensive. Yeah. So yeah, so I think you know, you, you know that's, any that's any hyper con any hyper converged environment is going to be able to run slightly fewer VMs per host than if you had an external storage system, but. I'm not concerned about it, it, except for the very largest organizations. You know, we end up deciding how many hosts there are for memory management or failure mode, failure domain management reasons, not because we just can't get the systems to run on that hardware. Yeah, I think the um, in the case of hyperscale, you know, is a good point. Is you're using you know, Haswell processors that have 24 cores. So if you're using one and a half per node, you know, as you said, was kind of consumed in the testing, um, you know, that's a very small percentage CPU-wise of the overall system. So it'll vary based on what underlying hardware you're using. Hyperscale is kind of the, the like, latest and greatest uh, very high-end hardware spec. So it uh, has a smaller percentage. On, on the behalf of myself and our fine sponsors at Atlantis USX, I'd like to thank you all for listening. It's been a pleasure. Um, when you look at the slide deck, there's an additional reference slide for the USX requirements. And of course, there's a lot more detail in the written report.